My name's Matt Simpkins. I'm an Anglican priest and musician. Not long ago, I was forced for the first time to properly consider my own mortality. I was shocked into reflecting on death, judgment, heaven and hell, the last things which Christians traditionally contemplate during Advent. And the folk hymns and gospel songs that I love as a musician suddenly shone with vivid new insights into these things. I was also drawn into the depths of the Psalms, those ancient songs fathoming human experience and emotion. Through what the Psalms and these songs had to say about death, judgment, heaven and hell, I became aware of a whispered light, a faint rumour of hope a slender thread of redemption that runs through them all. Amid the uncertainty of the COVID pandemic, I'd like to share that sense of whispered light with you. Whispered Light, an Advent podcast on the four last things, death, judgment, heaven and hell explored through songs and the psalms. Episode 2 Judgment I want to be ready. Having been thrown into considering death, thoughts of judgment soon followed. If my life ended tomorrow, I wondered, how would I be judged? Have I lived a good life? What sort of person have I been? What sort of person am I? One old hymn that came from the American plantations wormed its way into my consciousness. I could not shake it. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. When I'm judged, called to give account of myself, then I really would like to be ready. But how can we be ready? Is there time? What do we need to do? This train of thought tends to turn judgment into something terrifying. Just 
like John. I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. To walk in Jerusalem just like John. To walk in Jerusalem just like But what if, instead of fearing it or fighting it, we might find in judgment a source of hope? That's certainly the impression walk in Jerusalem just like John gives. When we consider why that might be, the link between the last judgment, justice and injustice, comes into sight. Maybe our fear of judgment might be an invitation to check our privilege. Maybe to those who suffer injustice, those who are oppressed or hated, the idea of a final judgment is a great hope because it brings with it the idea of a final setting right, a release, a vindication that's presently denied them. Then judgment can be sung about not as a moment of terror, but as the gateway into the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of heaven. Walk in Jerusalem just like John was first captured on record on Valentine's Day 1916. Under the title I Want to Be Ready, it was performed as a spiritual by eight singers from the Tuskegee Institute, Alabama. Just three months previously, the Institute's founder, Booker T. Washington, had died. Washington himself had been born into slavery and became the most powerful advocate for former slaves and their descendants in America, setting up his institute in 1881 as a centre for education. And nestled in Alabama, a state once economically dependent on slavery, it was for many a sign of hope. Tuskegee and other similar schools and institutes became centres for the performance of jubilee songs or spirituals. Even without this connection, Walk in Jerusalem Just Like John had roots in the troubled history of slavery in the US. Published in Old Plantation Hymns in 1899, it almost certainly predates the American Civil War and very likely had been sung on the plantations. On first listen, it appears that judgment is in this song only superficially. Oh John, now what did you say that I'd be there at Judgment Day? Judgment Day is here simply as the gateway to the new Jerusalem. Strikingly, the hope, the anticipation that the singer just might be able to pass through that gateway is profound. The repeating refrain, I want to be ready, I want to be ready, is about being prepared for judgment in order to access what lies beyond. It appears that Judgment Day is here being looked forward to. It's not hard to see why the promise of justice finally established at Judgment Day might fill those facing relentless injustice with hope and anticipation. The John who's being sung about is sometimes known as John the Divine or John the Elder or John of Patmos. But the best name coined for him came from the gospel musician Blind Willie Johnson, who called him John the Revelator. John wrote down the book of Revelation, which through allegory, symbolism and metaphor, tells of the final revealing of God at the end of the ages. The book's images are colourful and sometimes disturbing. They portray the times leading up to the end, the day of judgment. But they also portray the kingdom of heaven, the new Jerusalem with great tenderness, a place where God 
will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more. But who could possibly buy into that vision of peace in the new Jerusalem following Judgment Day when living surrounded by rampant injustice? How could those in bondage on a plantation sing with hope when so much of their lives were seemingly lacking in hope? To understand this, we need to wade back into the depths of those ancient songs, the Psalms, from which all this flows. When it comes to justice and judgment, the Psalms have two particularly important things to teach us. The first is their certainty in some final just judgment, their trust in an ultimate setting right when injustices will be corrected. That would surely be utterly unconvincing, however, if not for the Psalms' second insight. They describe, with painful accuracy, the reality of injustice and unfairness that persists in the world and the emotional responses that reality generates within us. Remember these psalms came together amid ancient Israel's experiences of slavery, exile, invasion and oppression. If the reality of injustice were carefully passed over or simply ignored, then the hope for a final just judgment would seem completely hollow. Psalm 1 sings of this setting right. The wicked shall not be able to stand in the judgment, nor the sinner in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked shall perish. This final judgment is not just about the individual, however. It's also about equity and justified favour for the oppressed. The Lord shall endure forever. He hath also prepared his seat for judgment. For he shall judge the world in righteousness and minister true judgment unto the people. The Lord also will be a defence for the oppressed even a refuge in due time of trouble. There are many, many more passages beyond that from Psalm 9 concerned with this final judgment. And then there are the lyrics about those who perpetrate injustice those who are up to no good and yet always manage to get away with it. Psalm 73 cries, I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked, for they have no pain. Their bodies are sound and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not plagued like other people. Therefore pride is their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes swell out with fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against heaven and their tongues range over the earth. Therefore the people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Does that sentiment hit a familiar nerve today? I think so. Yet, even when the very notion of justice or of right and wrong seems abandoned, we can sing this, knowing that our experience is shared across thousands of years. We aren't alone in this. And if, unsurprisingly, this makes us angry, well, there's a psalm for that also. These songs leave no emotion untouched and usually express them with unrivaled insight. The cry for vengeance of a person wronged leaps off the page 
in Miles Coverdale's 16th century translation of Psalm 58. Break their teeth, O God, in their mouths. Smite the jawbones of the lions, O Lord. Let them fall away like water that runneth apace. And when they shoot their arrows, let them be rooted out. Let them consume away like a snail and be like the untimely fruit of a woman. And let them not see the sun. Though the violence described is not what God intends for us, the emotional honesty is, I believe, valuable and helpful. Singers and readers of the Psalms can cry to God with the authentic voice of the psalmist and all those who have experienced the same emotions since. Frustration at and impatience with a lack of justice is a common theme in the Psalms. The complaint, how long, O Lord, appears eight times. So it's in the Psalms tradition of trust in a final judgment alongside frustration with the continuing presence of injustice that walk in Jerusalem just like John was likely sung on those plantations. 2020 has made painfully clear the injustices still suffered by the descendants of the first singers of this hymn and others. The righteous cry goes up that black lives matter, not as some sign of privileging a particular group or race, but because it is a basic truth that still seems to have been forgotten. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Without these cries of frustration, these descriptions of the impunity of the wicked, or the anger and the sorrow, the whispered light in the coming final judgment would simply dissipate into wishful thinking. Yet a trust and hope in the final judgment remains, even when all the pain of injustice and the dark emotional baggage that accompanies it are laid bare. But there's another crucial matter about judgment. Who is to judge? John's Gospel says that God the Father has given all judgment to the Son. So, in the coming of Jesus Christ into the world, God's judgment and God's love were made inseparable. Which means, of course, that we're talking about a type of judgment beyond our human capacity. When we think of judgment, we might think of scales, the good on one side, the bad on the other. But the Bible, aware that the human view of any situation can only ever be imperfect, repeatedly warns us against passing that sort of human judgment on others. Why do you see the speck in your neighbour's eye, but do not notice the log in your own? Jesus' joke is deadly serious. If the last judgment were simply like human judgment, 
if there was simply some weighing up of our good and bad deeds and qualities to test our worthiness of God, then I'm afraid none of us would make that cut. But God's judgment is something different. William Temple, Archbishop of Canterbury during the Second World War, helped explain God's judgment when reflecting on John's Gospel. Temple noticed three things. First, that John is clear God didn't send Jesus in order to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. To condemn is to make a judgment once and for all and abandon the person judged with no opportunity for amendment. John is clear that, that is not why God sent Jesus. Second, Jesus doesn't spend his ministry judging individuals. He doesn't hand out individual condemnations. But it's the third thing that Temple notices which is most interesting. He says, judgment is simply what results from Jesus' presence in the world. So we read in John chapter 3 verse 19, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. What is this judgment? It is coming into Jesus' presence and it is how we respond to that presence. It is being presented with the light and discovering whether we love light or love darkness. In other words, judgment is not only coming into Jesus' presence, but also how we stand before him there, how we relate to his presence. That's why I sing, I want to be ready. Will we come into Jesus' presence as people who readily love the light? To think of judgment like this should fill us with hope and joy even, because it is to come before Jesus. And yet, we still need to consider what it means to be ready. Those being baptised are asked, do you turn to Christ? It's a question that echoes through every moment of the life of a disciple. It is a relentless, ongoing process. We can't turn to Christ in self-righteousness, pretending we have a clean slate and expect him to say, you are worthy through your perfection. We can, however, turn ourselves to him each moment, acknowledging our failures to love and our brokenness. We can turn to him, accept his love, his invitation, his forgiveness, his grace at any moment. That is the hope of judgment, the whispered light in judgment day. Coming before Christ as someone who knows they need his love, his grace, his forgiveness. At the end of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus himself talks of judgment about sheep and goats. What he makes clear is that how we treat or don't treat the least, the disreputable, the outcast, the marginalised, is how we treat or don't treat him. Our care for those who suffer or our lack of it will form part of how we are judged. The pressing question is, do we really see Jesus in the outcast and the suffering? Especially those whom the world judges to be unworthy, disreputable or, or difficult. Do we turn to Christ through turning to them in compassion? Do we work for his justice to be known even when we're surrounded by injustice? Covid and its appetite for the marginalised, the poor, the old and for minorities has amplified and focused for us the great injustices that were already festering. 
The question that Christ the judge asks of us is, where do you stand on this? I want to be ready. It's easy to sing, but does who I am, how I'm trying to stand in relation to justice and love, reflect those words? It doesn't matter that we can never be fully ready. What matters is that who I am, who you are, can show that we want to be ready. And that's the same as turning to Christ in need and acceptance. To say all will be judged is to claim that there really is a final standard of justice, that ultimately injustices will be righted. It's also to say that we shall all come into Christ's presence as people who have the opportunity to turn to him. There, in him, judgment and God's love meet. We don't come into condemnation. We come into judgment and into the presence of love. That is the light whispered from judgment, despite all our hang-ups and fears. An early Christian probably writing in the tradition of John, explained that light very simply. God sent Jesus to save us through persuasion rather than violence, for there is no violence in God. He sent him to call us rather than accuse us. He sent him to love us rather than to condemn us.